join or, 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 or we've been attending all our lives. We're Christians because Jesus has come to us. We've taken him to be our Savior and his spirit now resides in us and rests in us. We are, and Paul says this also in his letters, he calls the collective people of God the temple of the Holy Spirit and then he calls individuals, temples, dwelling places of God the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus lived his life as a person on whom the Spirit rested. You remember what happened to him at his baptism? The Holy Spirit came from heaven and rested on him. And now what happens in Pentecost is that that same thing happens to us. As we take Jesus to be our Savior, as we trust in him as, as Lord, as we accept the benefits of what he did for us in his death and resurrection, God the Holy Spirit comes to us and fills us. Not just once, but again and again and again. You know, when Paul says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, he's using a form of a verb that means be continually filled again and again and again. And there are all different views of what is this baptism, what is this immersion in the Holy Spirit. And people have gotten stuck on the word baptism. Why? Because we baptize once in water, and so people think, oh, well, if it's once in water, it must also be once in spirit. But Paul says, be continually filled with the Spirit. And, and the word baptism doesn't mean once, it means be immersed, be dunked. And so uh, the sacramentalists are right, that when we pray over someone who's baptized, the Spirit comes. When we pray over someone who's being confirmed, the Spirit comes. The, the, the evangelicals are right, that when we are converted, the Spirit comes to us. And we are indwelt by God's Holy Spirit, who never leaves us. And the Pentecostals are right, that even after conversion, we can have a subsequent work, and then more works of the Spirit, more fillings, because we grow empty, we grow, we grow weak, and we need God to continually fill us with His holy presence. Well, why don't you put up that next slide? I've gotten a bit off the, uh, off the script. When the disciples began to speak... They were enabled by the Spirit. And what the Jewish Pentecost pilgrims heard, each in his own language, was, as Luke puts it, a declaration of the wonders of God. No doubt what they heard as they surrounded the disciples, they heard the praise of Jesus. They heard about his wondrous identity as son of God and son of man. They heard about his wondrous deeds as, as the one who recreates, the one who heals, the one who strengthens, the one who died for our sins, the one who rose from the grave, the one who sits on the throne at the right hand of God. The crowd was utterly amazed at this speaking in other tongues, and so they asked are not these men who are speaking Galileans. They come from all over the Roman world. You can see where they came from on this map. Wherever there were cities in the Roman Empire, there were Jews. And those who could afford to travel to Jerusalem, most of them, if they could, three times a year for these great feasts. They came and they, and they traveled and they brought their families and they brought their servants and they brought their, their offerings. Each came, though, with their own language and customs and cultures, but they were all united by the devotion to the God of Israel. And now, as these visitors stood out in the streets of Jerusalem, these Jews from far away could see fire coming from the place. And as they drew closer, they could hear the wind roaring, and above the wind they heard their own language being spoken, praising God and Christ. And as they looked inside, they were totally and completely floored as... For they noticed who it was that seemed to possess these amazing linguistic skills. What would you expect if you heard your own language being spoken? You'd expect someone from your land. But these men were Galileans. And Galileans were known for being uneducated brutes. These were uneducated fishermen and tax collectors. And, and who knows what else. They had, they had come together united by their faith and trust in Jesus. And they were speaking these foreign languages. They were declaring the wonders of God in foreign languages, miraculously. And so what we can picture is Jews from all over the world hearing the wonders of their God being declared, but with a new twist. For what they were hearing, each in his own language, was something new to them. 
Maybe they'd heard rumor about Jesus, but now they were personally experiencing it themselves. They were seeing for themselves and hearing in their own language that the Messiah of their God had come. He'd been crucified. He's now alive. He's reigning as king from heaven. He's pouring out his presence in spirit form to these fishermen. And they're utterly amazed because they're hearing these things each in his own language. What's the reaction of the cynics? They're drunk. They've had too much wine. You know, and these are the people standing off. They don't understand what's going on here, but the crowds are being drawn in. Many are, are believing. We read later that, that a great crowd was baptized in Jerusalem. They saw this, and it became personal to them, and they believed in Jesus, and they were baptized. But the cynics were reacting, as cynics will always do. They're drunk. They were reacting in a similar way to what the super atheists are saying today about the religious. They're deluded. If you can't prove it, they're going back to the, to the middle of the century being ultra-rationalistic. If you can't prove it empirically, then it can't happen. Peter's answer, as he begins his sermon, he says, this is not human-caused drunkenness, but God-caused. Then Peter refers to a well-known Old Testament text to explain what had, ju what had just happened. This is the Joel prophecy. And then he, he quotes, the, 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 the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He said, this is now beginning. History is beginning to wrap up, and it's starting here. And, and so what Peter does is he says the last days is, have begun. This big event is starting to come in motion, and the sign is the coming of the Spirit. Why is the sun dark and why is the moon turned to blood? Well, if the text is from, and this is a little bit of an aside, but it's interesting, Peter's quoting from the book of Joel. And in the book of Joel, the reason the sun and moon change color is because of a giant locust plague. It's a reenactment of, of, the, of one of the plagues from the Exodus story. But as Peter interprets, interprets Joel, he's saying that what you see here is what Joel is talking about. The end is coming. This, these great and terrible events are coming at some point in the future, but but now something has happened to mark off the beginning of that. The Spirit has come. God is beginning to put things right. Wind and fire are the symbols of what is happening now and what is going to happen. And he begins by saying no more categories, no more restrictions to the Spirit. Not just prophets, priests, and kings, but now the Holy Spirit has come to dwell in the midst of all God's people, from the youngest to the oldest, from the richest to the poorest. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Who is the Holy Spirit? And, and when some people talk about the Spirit, they, they use the wrong pronoun. Instead of saying who, they say what. But the Holy Spirit is a who. Who is the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit some kind of power we can control? Is the Holy Spirit just some vague sense of spiritual energy? Far from it. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a who. For at Pentecost, Jesus the Son and God the Father poured out their collective presence in the person of God the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist had promised an inundation of fire and spirit, and at Pentecost it came. Not a force, but a person. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is God's presence filling us. The Holy Spirit makes us his temple, his dwelling place. The Holy Spirit draws us to Jesus.